of events, our DG Conservatory, uh, set towards our musical theater writers. We have so many musical theater writers in the guild membership that we like to have special events for them every now and again. As always, if you have ideas for events, please feel free to let us know, and we're happy to try to find who you want to hear from, what you want to learn about. Just let us know. Uh, tonight, we're very excited to pair with um, Cal Ewald and Michael Ian Walker, who set up the very popular series, Behind the Music Hall, which they did down at the 92nd Street Y Tribeca. It's a very popular series down there, and we're really excited to have them here. They're both young guild members. We have other guild members tonight performing for you, so it's a very um, synergistic event that I'm very excited about. Since this event is actually on social media and media in the theater, we are asking that you actually leave your phones on. But please silence them if you have a crazy ring that will drive me insane and everyone else. So please put it on silence, but feel free to tweet, check in on Facebook, let everyone know you're here, take pictures, do whatever you want. We're happy to have all of you, and we want everyone to know that you're here. Flash. <laughs> I don't think you'll need flash photography. It's very well lit in here. Uh, I just I just want to briefly thank all of the performers who donated their time to come help us out tonight. I want to thank Michael Corey, who is on the Guild Council, for donating his time tonight to uh, help facilitate this event. And without further ado, here are Kyle and Thank you for coming. Uh, as she said, we're really excited to be doing Behind the Musical with the Dramatist Guild uh, and live streaming for the first time. Uh, we are super honored to have with us tonight uh, Michael Corey as our moderator, uh, who you may know from such amazing musicals as Grey Gardens, uh, or recently Far From Heaven, Playwrights Horizons. He also, uh, in addition to writing the lyrics for those musicals, writes a libretto for a number of operas, including Harvey Milk, and The Grapes of Wrath with Ricky Ian Gordon and Dr. Gervago, which is currently in Helsinki. So if any of you have travel plans, <laughs> go to Helsinki and see Dr. Gervago. It will be great. He's also um, currently working on a new piece with Doug Wright and Scott Frankel, uh, who were his Grey Gardens uh, co-conspirators, as well as a, a project with Disney, and is maybe, most importantly, a proud member of the Drama Discord himself. He's on the council. And he teaches at Yale Drama, too. He does lots of things. Uh, so we are very lucky to have him with us tonight, uh, and he's going to take over. We're going to have a conversation all about the internet tonight and how it's affecting musical theater. So have a seat, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, and for those of you um, tuning in, we encourage you to send in your tweets to uh, hashtag, hashtag new play. play. And we'll do it right from there, or you can do it from the internet. I actually challenge, will someone do something from there? <laughs> so this is the first Behind the Musical event uh, in cooperation with the Dramatist Guild. So let me just begin by giving a few of your credits. Kyle Ewalt and Michael Walker are currently at work on two commissions, one from Broadway Across America, which does not, I believe, have a title yet, and Pumped, a fashionable new musical about the world of designer shoes. Their show, Bromance, the Dudesical, was most recently performed and sold out concerts at Joe's Pub, Carolyn's on Broadway, and has been developed by Ground Up Productions. Their work has been seen in Michigan, Toronto, and London, and in New York at Playwrights Horizons, Joe's Pub, Theatre Row, Galapagos Art Space, and many others. And as I mentioned, they are the producers of this series. So um, before we play a song, just let me ask you, how did you guys meet and get started in this field? Uh, we actually met uh, at our day jobs about seven or eight years ago. Um, and yeah, still have day jobs. We, we, we part-timed them yeah. in kind of weird ways, which is great. We're right. halfway there, Michael. Right. We're halfway there. That's <laughs> what sort of jobs now. Um, I still have a day job. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so we met at, at management consultants, um, which has nothing to do with musical theater, but I mm -hmm. was a playwright by trade and was had a play that was uh, going up off Broadway, and Kyle was... Is. Writing dance electronica music with a dance pop collaboration. And how do you divide the labors in your collaboration? Who does what? Typically, we, uh, or we got into a groove where Michael would write the book to the show, I'd write the music, and we'd write the lyrics together. Um, one of our commissions was actually just for music and lyrics, mm -hmm. so it was a new foray to be writing mm -hmm. with uh, book writers. Oh, and uh, who were you working with? Okay. We were working with um, two folks, it was JD and Nicole Jacobson. And uh, yeah, it was a really interesting experience when you bring more folks into the um, creative process. That's fantastic. Well, we'd like to hear a song, so why don't you tell us about um, this show of yours, Pumped, and the first song. Sure. So Pumped is, uh, all, of, all of the music today we're going to share is from Pumped because we uh, just finished a reading of it like three weeks ago. Um, and uh, it sort of is good examples of how we are trying to balance the idea of, you know, narrative musical theater and songs that can be shared on the internet. Um, so the first song is called Little Shoe, and it's a duet uh, between the two romantic leads in the show, although they do not successfully know that they are interested in each other in this song. Um, one of the, the, the guys named Raymond, he's a shoe designer. The woman is named Gloria. She is reluctantly working at the shoe store, uh, but has learned a lot more about fashion. It's, it's a Devil Wears Prada type of story. Um, and in this song, the reason we want to do this song is that you'll see our second song is, is also Raymond's song, and it's called Lost Little Shoe. And this song is a scene set to music, as many songs need to be. The next song is a, is a standalone pop number that we sort of built out of the scene song. So we wanted to just Great. show the difference. And who do we have performing? Jonathan Witten and Autumn Hurlburt. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks, guys. That was fantastic. Um, before we get back to Pumped, why don't we just talk a little bit about this movement? Would you say that, how do you pronounce it, MewTube or MusicTube is a movement? Oh my gosh, are we creating like a new name for something? We're, we're going to make it happen. MewTube. <laughs> Musical theater, YouTube. Uh, I definitely, th so we feel like we're relatively new to the musical theater game in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, neither of started out in musical theater, right? Uh, six years ago when we came together was when we started writing. So I feel like as we were getting our feet wet and like learning more about writing together, we were also like, okay, well how, what do we see around us? Like who, who are the people that we sort of want to be our peers? Um, and, and it was quickly apparent that there is, a, there is just a second component to being a young musical theater writer, which is that you have to learn how to be a part of the social social media world, um, and that you know YouTube has been a, a big part of our getting known by people, getting known by you know students at universities across the country, hopefully even online right now, right? That that they want to find new sheet music by young writers, and they find it through YouTube. No, there's definitely a renaissance going on in this field. And would you say do you have any hard knowledge about how many people are actually? tuning in or any evidence? Are they buying music? Are they? Yeah, I mean, we sell, we sell sheet music through our website and the, the far destinations where people, you know, it's sort of exciting, it's sort of international sheet music sales. Sure. Make us very thrilled, right? When someone from London is like, I found, you know, bromance. We're like, how? That's amazing, thank you. Um, <laughs> but to your, to your point, I wish we had like quantifiable right. data to say, yeah, there are, you know, 14.6 million people around the world that are actively plugged into this group. And uh, I mean, if anybody has access to that, that'd be awesome to know because I feel like it'd be fascinating. But it's, it does seem to be substantial. No, and I know, even for me, who, I don't do any of this, but you know, Ricky Gordon mentioned a concert we were having at Carnegie Hall. It sold out in a couple of days um, and without advertising. So I know it's, it's very yeah. powerful. Would you say it's almost a necessity these days? to have an awareness on the way. Absolutely, absolutely. And and to be totally honest, you know, it's not the most natural thing to Kyle and I, which is sort right. of funny. So it's been a learning process for us. Um, you know, tweeting and, and using Facebook and, and getting the word out. So we just did a concert of bromance at Joe's Pub. And it, it also, so I don't know who, how the word spread, but the word spread, you know, we, we got, a lot, we got Facebook ads right. we've never had before, you know, and Facebook it just sort of exploded and the show suddenly sold out before, you know, weeks before we, we did it, which was way before we thought it was going to happen. And, and I think that, I mean, all through the internet, I mean, we didn't well, do any other well, advertising. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> interesting, in, in some respects, theater is always reinventing itself, and yet it's such a traditional field and the people that work in it do things in traditional ways and maybe in this instance the writers and composers are slightly ahead of the curve. I just know from the theater administrators, okay. dramaturgs, people that I work with all the time, are they aware of you and do they go onto the web to find out about you? Um, I think they will occasionally maybe, if they are told through another means, uh -huh. they will if maybe check told. you out. Right, they're some of you the know. least competent people I know <laughs> when it comes to... I think people will Google search, but, <laughs> yes. but no, absolutely, it, it's, we feel like it's a, a two-pronged career attack, right? That like, this is mostly to build support for just general people who are interested right. in, our, in our work. and who want to buy sheet music and, and who maybe want to do a college production of Bromance down the road. But, it, but you're totally right. It doesn't, it doesn't get us in the door. At, well, clearly there have been you know. success stories where, I guess, roads diverge, like yeah. title of show is yeah. one. Are there others that... Um I, I think so. I think it's also more the the composers and lyricists who so the the, the big hitters in this space, Kerrigan Loudermilk, Ryan Scott Oliver, Joey Joey Connors, uh, have had successes due in no small part to the fan base they've found online. Um, or their ability to aggressively pr pursue building that up. Mm -hmm. So I think those those folks may be the best examples of how this is like, 
they're just diving in with it. Mm -hmm. I think it's aided people who've been around for a while just as a new space. Um, but I do think it's really fascinating that it's become one additional pillar of responsibility as composers and lyricists. So you have writing material, you have networking with all the power players who are not connected at all, and then maintaining and sustaining and cultivating this entire new group of fans, supporters, future producers, kids in middle school who want to become musical theater folks down the line. It's, it's an, a completely in many ways separate yet becoming more and more okay. necessary. Let's talk about how you how you divide in your mind writing for um, YouTube or MewTube and writing for the stage. Um, there are two different things. I would imagine that what you have to put on YouTube uh, are short clips that work in a clip form. I, I don't think we, I mean, we've never written anything specifically just for the purposes of the internet. Mm -hmm. I think naturally because Kyle comes from a pop world, we tend to write a number of songs with pop structure, which therefore can stand alone. It, I think it's similar to like the audition song. Mm -hmm. I think if it's a good audition song, it's a good YouTube song. You know what I mean? The, By audition, you mean what you would play to? Yeah, uh, that like actors will want to buy to right, audition. Right. Okay. It sort of like tells its own story, or it it makes sense on its own. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a lift out uh, song or a lifty song. It just seems, needs to be self-contained. I yes, think so. Right. Okay. And that might actually bring us into hearing another piece. That's absolutely right. Um, <laughs> Is that where you were going, Mike? That is where, just where I was going. <laughs> I, was, I was going back to um, Pumped, and we're going to hear two more show, songs from Pumped, Little Lost Shoe and The Math. Um, you want to tell us about those, set those up for us? Sure, that. So Lost Little Shoe is, is um, in some way connected to Little Shoe, which you just heard. Uh, but this is the standalone ballad, okay. which, which can, uh, I mean, I, I was thinking of like five for fighting and emotional, like, kind of, poppy folk when we wrote this. Um, so in the second act, things have gone terribly wrong, and Raymond, our male love interest, um, feels betrayed by Gloria uh, and, and misses her dearly in, in many ways, too. So he's going to sing Lost Little Shoe for you. Um, so good, we'll set up the next one. <coughs> okay. um, no, let's do this one and then set up the next one. Great. So take it away, Jonathan Whitten as Raymond. <laughs> Without my 
for Gloria as well. Uh, her um, boyfriend, not Raymond, cheated on her. Uh, the company, the, the store has been sort of taken over by a company. Lots of things have gone wrong. Uh, and this is where she sort of figures all of that out. Um, and just sort of a side note about you know, Lost Little Shoe and, and the math is that like, Obviously, story has to come from. Well, Pumped is the most traditional musical I think we've ever written. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a big old school book musical. So it was very interesting when we were even talking about this theme and then we're like, what can we do from uh, Pumped? We were thinking, the, the interesting thing is, even within a traditional musical, we try to be sort of conscious about how, not, not only for the purposes of the internet, but also for the purposes of like how contemporary audiences consume music. You know, it's nice to have a, a moment where your leading man just to, gets to have his have his time in that sort of pop way, um, and and the math is less pop and more traditional. I don't know, swan song, not swan song, like <laughs> is that Burner, angry song. But but still, again, it's her eleven o'clock. Her eleven o'clock, yeah. and was that one his? I want. Well, it's it's. Or yes. further on in the show. Yes, I mean it's late in the show, okay, so it's not good. a setup I want, but I sort of I realized that I lost what I want. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. It's a really fun big show. We're giving you the the two bells. That's true. That's true. It's a very funny. Okay, funny. so now Autumn Hurlbard is going to perform the math for us. Thank you. 
April. That was wonderful. Um, just we have a few more minutes together. Um, suppose somebody listening to that wanted to get that music and put it, put it in their act. Um, could they? And where would they go? Not that yet. Okay, but uh, other. But soon, soon that uh, they can go to our website, eballsandwalker.com, uh -huh. e um, where we sell sheet music that is ready and available for sale. <laughs> um, you know that that is a, is a new show, and we're developing it. So right. we we tend to be rather conservative with well, our. Well, I would think sales. yes. I was going to get to that, but there yeah. are websites now for I guess called yeah. newmusicaltheater.com, yeah. where one can buy sheet music directly from. Yeah, the creators on that website. Absolutely. No, and and I think what's I mean, there's a, and there's a lot of great young writers on it. Um, How does one get on it? I, if one has, is it? Uh, I believe. I mean. We are not on it, so but okay. but I believe that I mean it's, I think it's through um, mostly through the people who run it, Kerrigan and Loudermilk, who are okay. composers themselves and and incredibly talented composers, who have been at the forefront of this sort of internet movement in many ways. I, I mean I think what's cool about that site and and cool in general about YouTube is that it's it's a very democratic way of making musical theater, mm -hmm. and it's sort of perhaps to producers' chagrin, like taking them out of the equation at least of communicating with. Your a potential audience. A potential audience directly. I mean, it's not the same as a production. It's not there, but it, but it, it certainly lets people hear your music and like your music. Oh, absolutely. It's almost it, seems like a new kind of yeah. Tin Pan Alley. Yeah. A uh, new kind of romance. I mean, it used to be before uh, popular music and theater music diverged and went on separate yeah. paths. They were the same, and audiences came knowing the songs. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're getting back to something like that. Yeah, I think there's certainly an element of it. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any tweets? No Not tweets. Yet. Okay. Um, I think we're going to open it up to questions to this group at the end, and then we'll bring everybody back. Absolutely. Um, so um, before we move on to Zach, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your work? Um, where we can next see it? Uh, well, we're what do, you're aiming for? What are we aiming for? We're, well, we're, we're working on the commission for Broadway Cross America, which is that's uh, great. about lottery winners, and that's that's the next thing that has to happen um, very really soon. soon. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so we're sort of nose, nose to the, the ground. And let's now, say, knock on wood, that gets produced. Yep. Um, is this a continuing thing that you'd like to do, try out your work? Uh, put it on YouTube. Oh, absolutely. Or is it a means absolutely. to an end? No, absolutely. I, I mean, I think even even creating this series behind the musical is is a lot about us. One, creating a space to share the stage with other emerging writers, which is a great joy, um, and not that many opportunities to do to sort of all be in a show together, and but also to to help, you know, create a forum to put things on YouTube to to get to communicate with younger younger I audiences. When you use the term renaissance, I'm really excited by that. And I like this idea of a you know a, a community that's kind of building off of each other and feeding off that energy and um, the you know, actors that are getting established and have their own followings and, and writers and then you know, uh, other folks in marketing and, and the theater world in general all coming together and building something up. It feels very exciting. And I think there's no doubt about it. I mean, compared to when I began writing musical theater, it was considered antiquated. One uh, it, and all the English had it locked up on Broadway. Mm -hmm. It's so different today, um, maybe partially because of the internet. Yeah. You, it actually drives people back to the theater in search of live entertainment and connection. Yeah. Uh, and its uh, ramifications are so interesting with shows like Glee and Smash, um, which are still mythologized. Nonetheless, it, it, yeah. uh, it brings back romance Absolutely. to the field. Yeah, and I think the next, you know, 10 years are when this is going to play out, too. I totally. Think you know, like, exciting because I don't know that, I don't know that producers have been convinced yet that this will drive ticket sales. I don't know that... Well, they're usually the last to they, learn they, they, if we know. can just figure out how to bring all this excitement down in price yeah. out there to the yeah. public. but I think it's, it's spiraling, which is cool. Okay. Well, let's move on to yeah. the next um, composer lyricist that we're going to be speaking with. Awesome. Um, we're now going to be speaking with Zach Zadak. Is he here, Zach? 
<laughs> Here you are. Did I pronounce that correctly? Very close. Okay. <laughs> Let me give a few of your credits, Zach. Zach Zadek is a singer-songwriter from Long Island and a composer-lyricist. His work has been heard at Joe's Pub, Le Poisson Rouge, Galapagos Art Space, and as part of In the Valley, the songs of Zach Zadek at Laurie Beachman Theater. Zach's sold-out musical Six was an intimate telling of six New Yorkers who, by six degrees of separation, unknowingly changed each other's lives, and that was selected um, for, by the New York Musical Theater Festival. His current projects include The Crazy Ones, a new musical about Steve Jobs and Apple. And that's what I wanted to start asking you about. How did you um, arrive at that? Um, I mean, I've always sort of had like a, a general fascination with Apple and with Steve Jobs in particular. His, you know, his very interesting story. Um, and sort of, it was just a matter of, of deciding that I wanted to sort of turn that into a project. Uh, I thought that it was it's a story that, that, that touched me and, and that I thought okay. would... would uh, and of course, every musical is a huge investment of time. Mm -hmm. Was there, a, did anyone advise you not to touch him? <laughs> that there were rights issues? Or did you feel... Yeah, I mean, I actually consulted with a lawyer mm -hmm. before I started writing the piece to, to make sure that it was worth that investment. And uh, it turns out it, it looks like... So in other words, he's a public figure. Exactly. And... Um, what about his actual language? Quotes. That, that's where you could run into some issues. Okay. The piece more uh, deals with his story mm -hmm. and his, his uh, accomplishments and sort of a character study of who he was. So it's less about maybe specific things that he said, but more about his journey as a person and in relation to Apple. Well, that's fascinating. And so that we can have some context, why don't we move right into hearing a song from this show, sure. if we can. I believe the first song is Something There from The Crazy Ones. Will you set that up, that up for us? Yeah, absolutely. So back in the days, uh, the distant days before there was YouTube and internet, um, the idea of the personal computer was even sort of a revolutionary concept. So this song uh, is, takes place in the very beginning of the show, and Steve Jobs has just stumbled upon um, an innovation that, that was revolutionary at the time that we all take for granted nowadays, the mouse. Um, and this is about his, his moment of realization that, oh my god, this could be huge. So who is going to perform this song for us? You know, I think I'm going to perform it. Fantastic. <laughs> OK, so um, take it away, Zach. Just carry these wherever I go. It's the mood of strength. Blocked.
Thank you. That was something there from the crazy ones about Steve Jobs. You know, it's fascinating how music just crosses the boundary. I can totally see that. I have no trouble believing that Steve Jobs could sing that song. Thank you. Um, and I think that, well, I think it has something to do with our culture, that TV has speeded up the whole process of mytholog mythologization. Mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, it's, which has been going on since Shakespeare. Hamlet was once a prince of Denmark, I'm sure. It didn't come out a thing like the play, but right. um, <laughs> it just happened faster now, and even faster thanks to the internet. Um, what is the uh, the plans for the crazy ones, and how far along with the project are you? Yeah. Um, so we did a, uh, our first reading of that actually this past summer at the New York Musical Theater Festival. Great. Um, which is a great, just you know, as writers to on its feet, you know, mm -hmm. see it's very different off the page and in the <laughs> real world. And now we're uh, doing and an working hard on a new draft of it, and we're workshopping it up in Connecticut uh, with a wonderful new little theater group up there in the next few months. We're really excited about it. Okay, and uh, given the theme of this discussion tonight, have you been using the new music media mm -hmm. to explore the, the creation of this show as well as the uh, awareness of it? Yeah, I mean, I think the really interesting thing about, because the crazy ones is, you know, intended to just sort of be a standard book musical. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because, you know, it's still in development, but at the same time, to stay to stay fresh, to stay part of all the stuff we're talking about, um, you have to put some stuff out there. But even, even sort of like the song that I just played, you know, the show is definitely still being written. It's still being refined. So the interesting thing is, I guess, finding the balance between what we put out there and, for instance, sort of the bridge of, of something there. While we were like any show in development, when we were workshopping it for this reading uh, this summer, we realized, you know, this bridge is really not right. It's, it's, yeah, it happens. So if you go on YouTube, for instance, you know, that was a song that you could find a recording of two years ago with a totally different bridge. Right. Um, so I think and it's, it's out there forever. It's out there forever. Um, hypothetically, you know, it could be, tried to be taken down, but I think it, it if, Maybe it makes, I, I don't know, but maybe it makes people uh, have a, an insight into a song creation process in a way that they might not if, if we just, you know, in, you know, 35, 40 years if it ever goes into production. Well, yeah. that was yeah. one of the things that I was interested in because, you know, um, I was, it was always a, my belief to keep everything private, as private can be. Um, because it was subject to change until opening night and perhaps beyond. Um, but come to think of it, it doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, to have variant versions, you're almost like your own archivist. Um, it's very interesting, when, when I started out, something like this never would have happened. Um, uh, my songs were played um, as part of a showcase uh, that Lehman Enkel sponsored from the BMI workshop. It was the last couple of years that Lehman was running it himself. Uh, I wrote a couple of songs and instantly got offers from agents and producers, but it was an industry only thing and nobody would have ever thought to involve the uh, general public or the national constituency of writers, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that the Dramatist Guild is vitally committed to. Do you hear from people? Do you get feedback from people on the, on the things that you put out there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's maybe by the nature of, you know, what you said just putting out there, instead of in that closed, in like BMI, it's a right. contained Right, very thing. closed yeah. shop, yes. Um, yeah, and it's an interesting, it's an interesting shift, mm -hmm. you know, that a song is, you know, you put it out there. I think so much of this has to, you know, it's so intertwined with concert culture because right. these videos, the ones that, uh, that I think all of us are really talking about are not, you know, the YouTube videos of someone in their, in their bedroom with a guitar and some kittens around and, you know. Yes. I, I love a kitten YouTube video. We all love it. We don't need to pretend. Um, but... So in other words, you try and pick concert venues. Well, I, yeah, these videos are coming from mu new musical theater concerts, which right. in itself is a totally, I think, a, a new form of exposure. It is. Um, 
What are the, the costs I'm interested associated with this? I mean, when I make a, we just finished making a original cast recording. Um, it's a prohibitive, it's enormously expensive. Uh, what are the costs and do you pay performers um, and do you pay musicians who appear on these YouTubes? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's sort of, the, you know, it depends on each particular situation. Um, but at least speaking to my first my first concert that I that I ever tried to put up, um, I really couldn't. I was a right. uh, I'm still a college student with you know not with limited funding for this kind of a thing, um, and I, I had performers and musicians who, you know, I, I basically said to you know listen, this is the situation. I really I I appreciate your work. I think you know I want to work with you, um, and there's a level of trust I think there that you know that. There's a community of people helping each other try to get to the next level of their work. And are you concerned with issues of piracy or intellectual property rights uh, with your ideas out there? Yeah. I mean, it's a great idea, Steve Jobs as a musical. I mean, I think the interesting thing is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think that uh, sort of ideas themselves can't be copyrighted only the execution of them. Or so, you know. I feel like the idea for Steve Jobs' musical um, is not. Well, I hope it's it's somewhat innovative. I ho I don't think it's particularly. No one could steal the work that I've written because it's it could be copyrighted. So I feel like the idea itself. Well, you know, it's no more than an idea for Bill Gates' musical or. A, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. It's all about how you do it. Right. Um, anyone can do it, but they're not you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, why don't we hear some more songs, uh, I believe from the show Six. Sure. Yeah. Tell us about the development of that show. Um, so I started writing Six uh, my, going into my freshman year of high school. I was coming out of theater camp on Long Island. Um, and I decided, you know what, I, I would love to, you know, I didn't get cast in, in our camp production of Third of the Modern Millie. Oh, well, that's um, how Madonna started. Exactly. Um, I, um, so I, you know, I realized that, you know, I play piano and, and writing my little songs. I, I, you know what, I, and I love musicals. I'm going to try writing a musical. Um, so I worked on it sort of throughout high school, and we did it at my high school as, our, as a high school show. Um, and then as I you know, moved to the city to, to go to school, um, I kept working on it and kept revising it. And it finally ultimately got into the New York Music Theater Festival last year. And uh, we're still working on developing. Fantastic. And tell us about the first song that we're going to hear from, uh, from Six. Sure. Um, so this song, Blinded, um, sort of comes at the end. So six is the six individual sort of stories of people going through their individual life, lives, you know, sort of isolated. And what the show attempts to do is connect, let you view as the audience the connections between them and sort of show how actually one of these isolated people affects another, affects another, affects another. So this character's uh, Tess, this is, the, this is the last song that she sings. Of and this is set now? This is set in the present, yeah. And this is her last song for of her individual journey, and she's basically gone through uh, a brutal divorce with her husband, um, which the audience is aware of that another character is partially to blame for. But she doesn't really have that insight. Uh, instead, she just feels like she was blinded or sort of, you know, from left field, this thing hit her that her marriage wasn't what it was, that her husband was cheating on her, and that, you know, that she was wearing sort of rose-colored glasses about the whole thing, maybe. Great. Okay, and who's going to be performing the role of Tess? Uh, the wonderful Hannah Ellis, who, who sang the role last summer. And are you accompanying? Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, party foul. <laughs> <laughs> it's live. That'll be an easy one.
much. Zach, um, before, come, before, before I ask you to uh, set the uh, next song up for us, let me just say to those uh, watching on the web, uh, if you have a question, you can send to hashtag new play. Um, so the next song, also from Six, is called Just Me. Can you set the scene for us? Sure. Um, so in the show, uh, another character, Emma, who ironically was the, the, the young lady who did ruin uh, <laughs> her marriage, um, has just fit, uh, finished this brutal affair with her professor, as you would have it. Um, and she's finished medical school, and she moved to the city sort of bright-eyed and bushy-tails, and was like, you know, I'm going to take the city by storm. And got sort of dejected along the way. And now, at the end of this whole journey that she's had as her, in her first six years in New York, she realizes, you know what, I think I can do it. I don't really need outside assistance. It's, it's sort of, I have it in me. Um, but sort of interestingly enough, you know, talking about YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. I feel like the song out of the show sort of has its own context of just, you know, all of us, you know, people in New York trying to, whether you go to medical school or have affairs, you know, just trying to make our own, <laughs> our own, our own way in the city. So this is a standalone song that could work out of context too. I hope so. Fantastic. And who's performing it for us? Um, a great fellow classmate of mine, Dara Orland. Great. So Dara Orland is going to perform "Just Me" from Six. Yeah. While he's setting up, how did you two meet? Um, we have a lot of mutual friends. We're both involved in the acapella community at NYU. And yeah. Fantastic. So, actually, we met through Facebook, I guess. Oh, say. good. Yeah. <laughs> That's another drama this girl series. Totally yeah. 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 <laughs> So 
Thank you. That was a real tour de force. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, Zach, that's wonderful. Can I ask you to come back at the end with everybody and we'll open the floor to questions? Sure. Super. Thank well, that you was so terrific. Much. Thank you. Um, and next we're going to be talking with Joey Contreras. Joey, hi. hi. Um, let me just give them a few credits. Uh, Joey, credit, Joey Contreras is a musical pop songwriter. His musicals include All the Kids Are Doing It, was just received a workshop production at the Provincetown Theater with the Steinhardt School, NYU. He's also created the song cycle, This Thing Called Love. Joey's original compositions and arrangement have been featured in New York City venues, including Joe's Pub, Lincoln Center, Le Poisson Rouge, Laurie Beachman Theater, and the Duplex. Performances of his music have stretched as far as Australia, Germany, South Korea, and the UK. And his first album, Love Me, Love Me Not, the music of Joey Contreras, features performances by Broadway talent and is available on cdbaby.com. <laughs> yes. So be Sorry. before we uh, before we go into a performance, um, how has this new music video um, been of assistance to you? Are you talking about the Playbill series? Well, I was going to get to that later. Okay. In general. In general, um, YouTube and the whole social media world has played a huge role in um, my success as mm -hmm. a writer thus far. Um, I, uh, right when I was graduating college for musical theater um, is when a lot of the new musical theater was starting to come out there on YouTube and whatnot. I was one of those fangirls listening to <laughs> Kerrigan and Loudermilk and Pasek and Paul and I was just like, I'm writing music and not only do I relate to what they're writing, but this is kind of the style that I'm writing too. And it kind of created this, I don't know, immediate like world that I felt made sense. So, um, so in the immortal words of Ed Cleveland, I can do that. I, I can do that, exactly. Right. Uh, I, there was, a little, there was a, a little bit of that. And um, so it was exciting and inspiring. And um, right when I, was, when I was graduating college is when I started really um, writing musical theater related stuff. And I started you know, having people sing it and, um, and started putting it online. Fantastic. So let's uh, let's hear some music. Um, the first thing we're going to hear is "I Could Fall" from this thing called "Love," your song cycle. Would you like to set that up yeah. for us and, and introduce first, the performers? Yeah, and I also want to say hi to my mom and my stepdad who are watching over there. Um, okay, so um, this <laughs> this first song um, is "I Could Fall" from a song cycle called "This Thing Called Love." And um, Natalie Weiss and Eric Michael Crawford are going to come sing it. And uh, <laughs> and um, this thing called love is essentially a song cycle. So there are um, a bunch of standalone songs that are strung together by a common theme. And uh, this is also the first song from the uh, album Love Me Love Me. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You're ready.
It's like we always plan to meet When my hair's a mess When I have bad breath It never fails, damn it But then you choke And you always laugh And we both start to linger I will be the one to say it, no I will be the one, no, not today This is not right, this is not okay I could fall back in love I could fall back in love with you Even though you drive me crazy I've been seeing much more lately I could fall There's something dangerous when I look into your eyes They somehow make me forget all of your lies Now your nagging seems so inviting I no longer mind them <laughs> fighting Thank you, that was great. Um, Joey, if we were to look you up on YouTube, what would we find? Um, goodness. Um, on YouTube, you would find a lot of um, songs from concerts that I've put up there, and also, thankfully, um, a lot of performances from kids across the world, honestly, um, which has been really fantastic. Um, the college musical theater scene has been really wonderful for, wonderful for me and towards me. Um, they've really uh, just have embraced my music in, in a really lovely way and has um, kind of been the, the, the thing that's been pushing me along. And, and you also have a CD out there, yeah, correct? Yeah. So do these things feed each other? Yeah, um, when I first moved to New York, um, I went straight into, straight into concert world, and, um, and then once I had my first concert in the city, I was like, well, what am I going to do next? Why don't I just throw myself into an album? I was in <laughs> the city for three months, and um, I didn't know anybody. Uh, I didn't know any, like, I didn't really know exactly how to, how to start it, but I just started meeting people. and. Um, Thankfully, a lot of incredible, incredible people wanted to be a part of the record, including Natalie, who's on it. And um, the amount of talent that I was able to get immediately was fantastic. And I think working with those people that have established fan bases already mm -hmm. as prominent and up-and-coming Broadway performers um, really helped expose my music to a lot of other people, too. So people that were searching for Natalie Weiss got to hear my music, and people that were searching for um, Kyle Dean Massey and, and uh, Jeremy Jordan, you know, are hearing my music as well. So it's been such a lovely experience. Um, this one. Okay, and will this song cycle eventually take a dramatic form, do you think? You know, that is something, that's a good question, because um, right before I moved to New York, I did have a workshop production of it, and that was the first time that I was able to see like how it lived and breathed as, it's, as, as that, as a stage song cycle. But then once I, um, recorded the album, those songs started living on as like, as an album versus a staged production. And then once the album came out, I went to the NYU grad program for musical theater writing and I knew I didn't want to get stuck in song cycle or concert land. I wanted to write a book show. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really the reason why I looked at that program and, um, and since then now a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is working on the book show that I wrote um, through that program, which is all the kids are doing it. Right. And um, and now I am working on a, on a second album, but that's kind of going more into my love for pop music as well. So I'm kind of balancing my two of my loves, which is pop music and, and that, and, um, and writing 
book shows because that is something that I don't want to lose. I don't want to get stuck in concert land, you know? Right. So. You know, this is so interesting. Um, I remember when I was starting out how theaters and producers used to hire directors of development uh, ostensibly to find new writers, but I often felt that they were the guardians of the gate. Um, and I remember in particular, well, I sh I'll, I'll name names. Um, <laughs> I was called in for a meeting to the Nederlanders, um, and uh, the person in charge of development took me into the room and said, do you want to know how much stuff we get? And he showed me these three huge tables laden with scripts. And on the first said, stuff we hate. Oh. And the second said, stuff we really hate. Oh. And the third said, send back immediately. <laughs> and I said, where's the stuff you like? Well, there was none. But it seems that this, the people associated with this movement you're in are taking control of that situation, not waiting to be discovered by people who may or may not want to discover you, but putting the work out there. I think... Um you know, they're starting to try to label what this generation is in, in general, not just specifically musical theater, but, right. you know, this is this whole do-it-yourself generation where we are all kind of, you know, if someone's, we're not going to just sit and wait for the offer to come to us. We're not just going to sit and wait for, you know, the record label, to, the major record label to sign us. And so I think the creation of things like YouTube and, and SoundCloud um, and Facebook, all of these these um, social media networks have have encouraged people to be more creative and to and to give into their creative urges and to get it out there and then start um, developing communities communities within that. And um, I think that's the exciting thing about it. I, I would agree, and I know Bill Finn on the Dramatist Guild Council with me once spoke up and said, you know, there's no great big deal about having your workshop done by uh, an official theater. It's nice, but you don't have to do it. You can do it in your living room. You could do it anywhere you want. Um, and that's, that's how you develop it, and that's how you learn. Um, I think we'd like to hear another song now, from uh, before we talk about the Playbill series, yeah. from your song cycle. Can you set that up for us? Yes, this song is... Um called Love Me, Love Me Not, and it was the first song that I put on uh, YouTube, actually. <laughs> and who's going to be doing that? Natalie. Great.
Um, so, Joey, um, the next one we're going to hear is from an online series called The Playbill Series. Can you tell us about that? Um, yes, The Playbill Series is actually called Hot Off the Ivories. And um, this idea, uh, as a new writer and embracing this world of putting your music out there, um, a lot of writers understand that there's a lot of pressure when you do concerts because when you get when you when you're filming it, then you have you are praying that nobody messes up and that you know the performance is great and you're premiering a song and there's like no pressure but you're premiering the song you know. <laughs> um, and so there would there were a couple there would be all these concerts where you know I would be doing this and then hoping that the video would turn out great. So I had this idea that I. Um, wanted to ha kind of have a little bit more control over how my music was going to be premiered online. And um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier that I've been so lucky to have is such incredible collaborators um, on all different you know, roles, but actors especially, um, the people that have sung my music have really been such a po huge part of um, the development of my music. And so my idea was to, to bring writers together with incredible Broadway performers, incredible vocalists, incredible people, and um, have a couple cameras and shoot these music videos, essentially, of, of new musical theater. And so it's like a sleek and intimate um, presentation of new material. So how is that? How was that filmed? Um, well, I've been. This is the first time that I've kind of stepped into the producing role, mm -hmm. um, so it's been a little bit of a learning experience. Um, I have an incredible videographer, and we've been um, um, going on this 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 journey together. And um, thankfully, Playbill was very supportive of it. Um, we the first time I did it, I wanted everything to be live. I wanted because I wanted to capture the nuance mm -hmm. of performance. I didn't want to have any lip syncing at all where we pre-record the music. Um, and that can be very effective depending on what kind of miking equipment that you have. I am still a, a struggling writer, as, of course, as well. And so my budget is not necessarily, you know, at right. smashed budget or <laughs> glee budget. Um, but we finally figured out a way to make it uh, so that we um, still can capture the performances and, um, and have the highest quality sound. And so we do record it a few times, and then um, we have lab mics, we have overhead mics, um, we film it, and then they sing. Okay, and songs. hot off the ivories. So the destination is at playbill.com? Playbill.com. Um, there's already been a couple episodes um, of some of my songs, and then um, we've also premiered um, songs from Tyson and Miller mm -hmm. and Zoe Sarnak. And, um, We've taken a little bit of a hiatus, but we're going to premiere a new episode, um, I think, hopefully in the next few weeks. Wonderful. So. so can you set up the situation for the next song, which is actually on that series? It is. Um, this next song is called Great Cool, and Eric Michael Krop is going to be singing it with me. And this was the first, um, the first video in the series. <clears throat>
a couple of tweets and I of course like to open the field to questions but I was hoping that all the writers uh, could come back up here can we up to questions you know we've been hearing about um, new media putting songs out there getting excerpts out there, but we've maybe given a little short shrift to books. Um, and of course we know, and especially at the Dramatist Guild, how the book, the playwright, is the spine of this whole thing. Once it gets into the theater, to many writers and audiences, these days it seems that the score is almost secondary to the, the zeitgeist, the, the, the meta of the whole show. Um, and, and yet, this movement seems to bode for a little bit of the yin to that yang, um, that you are developing followings based on songs. Um, can you, do you care to comment on that and how you feel that this experience will help you when you get into the theater where the show has to be performed? I thought it was funny, because when you said that, I was like, them's fighting words for a panel of composers. Well, I you think know? that it probably uh, helps each I'll other. Be okay, you can be on his too, that's fine. <laughs> no, but I think it is interesting. The art form will only be pushed in the direction that it should go if people are on both sides of that, I think, and are developing right. both sides of that. So just as it's important for the maturation of book writers to have their finger on the pulse of what audiences want from the side, from the book side, I think that, you know, I'm not saying you guys are only in that camp, but it's important to be ready with um, great music and lyrics as well. Yeah, I mean, I, as I, they mentioned, I also wrote operas, and I think some critic of some review said it's all well and good to have a, a good libretto. But operas aren't uh, the the opera with the the best music is remembered. Not you don't go out singing the libretto. Um, but as you say, there is some balance. Joey, I think I think um, it's very easy to create a serviceable score. And, and many shows have gotten by with that. Exactly. And so I think that that is something to always keep in mind, is that, is this music serving the show? Great, but how can, how can we go above and beyond so that it is a tuneful score, it is a memorable score, it is an exciting score, it is this and that, because I think when you're creating a show, things sometimes, a lot of emphasis goes on book because book needs 
the most work in that moment and the music falls to the side and and ultimately you want it to be a marriage of both music and lyrics but you want it all to and everyone to be kind of giving their a-game well, you know I, when i saw the, the fairly recent revival of west side story and the audience heard that music live i heard people saying to each other aha this is what theater music sounds like. <laughs> and that score is just, it's beyond period. Beyond. Zach, period. What, are, what are some of your influences? Theater shows? Or any of you? Well, I just tweeted today that whenever I sit down to write a song, I think, what would Leonard Bernstein do? <laughs> what would Sarah Bareilles do? And what would the Dr. Luke, who is a major pop producer in Britney and Katy Perry's camp? That's how you write. That's those are my three inspirations sure. as a writer, and they're very eclectic. But that is what that's makes good. Them. And just to be on the edge, also ask yourself, what would Marcel Duchamp do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a couple of tweets here that I, we'd like you to answer. Um, are you guys making CDs or only digital? Like physical? Question. Digital. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my album comes in both physical and digital format. Right. Yeah. So I guess I can make a quick departure into dance pop land, not necessarily musical <laughs> theater, though we're hoping to marry that in a upcoming project. Um, we stopped doing physical CDs um, about three years ago, my, my dance pop collaborator and I, just because it's so cost prohibitive um, to deal with art and constructing and, um, and distributing iTunes has really changed the game on how quickly you can get something. Right now, we go from mastering to online sales in two days. And it's, so that has allowed us to put out five albums and four singles between in rapid succession. Now, they're not going on to sell thousands and thousands of copies, but they are going, they're selling fairly well. But I feel like you've also, to plug them a little bit, have they? They're called Kaiven. Look them up. Uh, Kaivenmusic.com. <laughs> they become more popular in the three year, like more and more popular in the ensuing years without physical CDs. So it's not like CD sales. Physical CDs were a part of the. Oh, you're going to put art directors out of business. Um, <laughs> still have, we need that still cover, art cover art. Cover. Okay, good. <laughs> and we have another tweet here. Um, do you writers, knowing that performers will want to use your songs for auditions, do you actually think in 1632 excerpts? <laughs> I always joke that I wanted. I always joke that I wanted to write like an album of just 1632 bar cut songs. Period. Like. Yeah. like I'm totally going through our catalog right now and trying to see if anything fits into that. Yeah, no, I don't think we've ever, I don't think well. we've ever thought in, in cuts. I think we have certainly thought of sort of the use of a standalone song, but I don't know. Well, I'll tell you, sitting on the other side of that table, I never cut somebody off at 16. Mm, yeah. Kind of off at they, No. <laughs> No, that's what the assistant casting agent does. By the time they get to me, I hear the whole thing. Well, what's interesting um, about that question, if we talk about a recognizable pop hook or a, or a chorus, that lends itself to that, right? right? So if you go right into the chorus and your chorus is pretty manageable, then that's your 16 or 32 cut. And I think maybe more so now, this movement has, has gone in the direction of traditional pop structure, dare I say, which makes it easier for us. I think... Um, I think Joey said something interesting when when you were having your discussion um, about you know you said the phrase getting caught in the concert thing and yeah. you know it's an interesting it's an interesting thing because while we're we're all talking about um, you know how YouTube has helped our careers and YouTube and this new concert medium you know I think it, it also is a double-edged sword in the sense that. You know, that phrase, I don't think you'd say that before this whole thing began. And, and that's, you know, I think that we have to, sometimes as writers, at least me personally, you know, keep keep your eyes on the end game. And for me, that's sh musicals. And the interesting thing is that that is a trap, I feel like. And I'm, I'm cognizant of that. And I, I'm it's something that I think all of us are, are it's on our minds, because, you know, Joey brought it up. But to get caught in the like, you know, as, as fine and dandy it is, is to write a song for a 1632 bar cut, to write a song for YouTube that will get, get hits and get us traction for sheet music sales. You know, in the end, 
I, you know, I wanted to be about writing a score. I wanted to be about writing a show. I wanted to be, you know, going about about your book, your question about the book. You know, books don't really factor into these concerts really at all, with very rare exception. Um, and there's been a few that I've seen that people do it successfully. But you know, that's it's it's tr it's a tricky one. There's, there's, there's no ones. there's no there's no second best to being in a theater and connecting with the audience. But I somehow feel that this experience is going to be very valuable to you when you get there. Um, we have a few minutes left. Why don't we open the floor to questions from our friends here? Um, Would you like to say your name oh, and stand hi, up? I'm Beth Falcone, and I just wanted people to know that there's another website as well, contemporarymusicaltheater.com. Contemporarymusictheater.com. Yeah, I think it's contemporarymusicaltheater.com. And they also are have an educational component. They've gone out into schools and voice teachers across the country and actually even internationally now. So it'd be great. Uh, I just think writers and performers ought to know about this one as well because it has a little bit of a different uh, target audience. Fantastic. Let's go put it together, and he's a, a composer there. Good, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Stuart Green. I know that, uh, what had come up was that, uh, I forget which one, I'm sorry, that uh, you had put your work out there and people were performing it and you were able to see that work. Um, have you, and this is a, a, to everybody, seen your work performed that actually gave you ideas for the next project that you were working on that you wouldn't have had had you not put it out there in the first place? Do you mean do you mean performances that we were a part of, or from someone else, like so like doing a, a rendition of our stuff? Yeah, like you put your stuff out there, you see what people do and how they adapt and how they translate it and how they personalize it, and then in seeing that, that kind of comes back to kind of refresh your thinking and then maybe give you new ideas that you wouldn't even have thought in either your piece or future work that you're working on. I think there's a little bit of a feedback loop, you, you were almost saying that, where um, we've seen a couple people perform one of our songs called The Phone Call, which is from Romance, and just saying, huh, well that was an interesting way to interpret that line, but meaning in, in a really great way of we had never worked with an actor who delivered the material in that way, and it does cause a little bit of a rethink. I think we talked a bit about the relationships that we've all had with actors who are kind of on their way up in the world as well, and it truly is collaborative when you're hearing what's being done in front of you and, and taking from it. So I think that um, it is in tandem that stuff's coming from online that's inspiring as well. I mean, the other part of that is that when something is getting traction, it, it is confirmation that perhaps an idea or a story or music is going, you know, so again, if you look at the phone call, we, it, it's, you know, it exploded online, right? It was, it was the first song of ours that just sort of took off, and it's from this, you know, wacky show about dudes called Bromance, right? And so it sort of moved that show to the front of our priority list because suddenly there were 100,000 hits on the song. You know, like, and you're like, whoa. Give the people what they want. Right, so you know what I mean? So, like, that's not, like, I mean, it was, it, we put out the song. It was a person that we had, and, and he had his own following, which is what he's talking to. But, but it certainly, there is a confirmation of that, and, and it, it has to be about the story, which is what you're saying, and it has to be about the eventual show, but there is, there is something in that. There's some sort of, you know. It informs where we spend our time, because time is finite, right? And here you're talking about pursuing concerts, and how many hours in the day do you have to write for something that you hope will be stage-bound seven years later, as you know, the, this is a, a totally patience-involved process, but also keep yourself relevant and new stuff and be hot and be at Le Pousson Rouge, ready to go. Like, how do you balance those worlds? Um, but this reaffirmation of, oh, you're doing something right, kind of steers your ship in a direction, which will then eventually, hopefully, put you onto the stage. We have another tweet. Um, when you are looking for a vocalist, do you lean towards uh, pop or Broadway styles? Or do you differentiate between these? Depends on the song. Depends on the depends song. On the song. Um, depends on the song. Depends on. Time. What is the difference between a pop sound and a Broadway sound? Increasingly less. Well, yeah. <laughs> I would think particularly uh, training. 
how much American Idol the person wants to know. I feel like right now, like we're gonna be all like you know, one eight six six. Yeah, like, yeah. Run there. <laughs> Idol seven. Right, right. right. Um, I think that for me, you know, because I, I like to write both theater songs and pop songs, and where the diff, you know, where that line is is interesting. But for me, the most important thing is the acting for the theater material. It's it's finding somebody who can convey the. I mean, you know, again, it's about the story, first and foremost, in the theatrical setting. For the pop setting, it may be more about who can wail, you know, who can just sound the best and who can, you know, just convey the emotion. I think it's about also, for me, uh, a performer who can command the song and not let the song command them. So, um, a lot in pop music. What I found uh, interesting recently was I was reading an interview with a, a producer. And, um, and how they would audition a certain track with different singers to see where it just fit, where it was just in the pocket. Like it has nothing to do with the person's technique, it just, it's that perfect fit. And, um, and sometimes it just comes down to that, you know? Um, we have a few more minutes. I was interested in knowing about your relationship with theaters and how this might um, affect that. You know theaters, the types of theaters, resident theaters, some of the great, they have development departments and uh, naturally they want everybody on their staff to be involved from the inception. Um, is your ideal scenario that someone would hear your stuff and call you in and say, do you have a new idea for us? Or would you rather that something get developed that you have already begun? You're good either way. I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah. I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't mind somebody being like, hey, we want to commission you to write something. And I'd be like, cool, great. I will, you know. Great, great, cool. <laughs> It's the sequel song. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the one that's coming in. Um, no, but I mean, I, I, I'm so open to just to writing, period. Um, and so that's a conversation that, we, that would need to be had, of course. But like, I would be excited to either, A, get a phone call from a company to be like, we're really interested in you and in, in your voice as a writer and we want to see what this could be, or me already having something. I think it kind of adds a, a, a level of when you know that there's a commission, commissioning, commission, what am I like? Commissioner. Commissioner involved, it kind of adds a little bit of flexibility thing with the writing part, because then you're, you know, you're, you're comfortable in that. Well, that's good to know. And for theaters and development departments all across the country that may be listening, <laughs> let's not be New York centric about this. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you would go anywhere to develop a new idea. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure for you, right? I mean, there stories that you become passionate about that you want to tell and then projects oh, that you I find have, the passion I have, after, I right? have to fall in love with the project yeah. uh, in order to really write a show about it but not all the shows that I've fallen in love with have been generated by me. I've fallen right. in love with other people's ideas. Um, so I'm always interested in talking. I'm not necessarily interested in following through. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that you do us. I feel like we in some ways are the do-it-yourself generation can go out and do it, but in other ways still are at the mercy of where some people want to go. I was having a conversation with a, a pretty well-known director who um, was leading his own projects and was far enough along his own career where he was calling the shots and yep. would call the composer lyricist to come in and work for him to get something well, done. Well, this is why you must all join the Dramatist Guild <laughs> if you are not already a member because <laughs> that is the, the really more. wonderful organization uh, formed by playwrights and creators of theaters and composers who really look out for our rights. Um, it's an organization that is just growing by leaps and bounds um, and we have a wonderful quarterly that we put out um, and uh, a website that everyone should tune into and find out uh, about people in your position and what your rights are because a director cannot come in and treat you that way. Um, do we have any more questions? <laughs> just a quick question. Is there any value to putting a song of yours on YouTube, like just the music without a video component? I think that there are better services for that than YouTube. So while we've, we've this, you know, this panel has been YouTube-centered, and 
I think largely this new musical theater thing is, is YouTube centered. Um, you know, SoundCloud would be when I think audio and finding new audio for up and coming mm -hmm. indie artists that I like, that's the site that I go yeah. to. Mm -hmm. That being said, there are still plenty of people who put up just audio tracks with a, a still photo of the performer, or even better, really, really elaborate lyric <laughs> presentation. Have you seen this where it's like, you know, if the line is, I just woke up on Sunday, it's like, I just woke up on Sunday. It, it looks amazing, and there are, you know, 400 people in the world that know how to do it, and it's not that hard. Or, or a slideshow of kittens. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question. Oh, just oh sorry. No, I was going to say, I think the reason that videos are more popular is, again, going back to the fact that, like, a lot of this movement is really tied to actors who have fans. So, I mean, like, not to call her out, but Natalie it is very successful on the internet. Like, she's, she's an incredibly talented actress, but she also has a very dedicated internet following. So, like... If she's in the video, people watch the video for her and for the composer. And there's great. Okay, we have time for one more question. <laughs> this is our final question. Question for the composers uh, regarding the costs involved. Uh, what are your uh, what sort of orchestration are you thinking of with the, the synthesizer and piano? Very interesting. How much does it cost you to orchestrate, synthesize, and put these up on YouTube? Or rather, what sort of orchestration were you, uh, would you be planning to uh, use? I think. Sorry. No, please go. I think normally in concerts we have a band, and then that. And How big a band? I mean, four to five, four to five pieces is, is normally what it is. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you might be recording in. in a studio in your apartment on GarageBand or Logic, or you have, you know, a studio connection. Um, for my series on Playbill, I keep it very bare bones, just piano, piano guitar, singer, just acoustic. Um, I think we have to, in a lot of ways, keep it basic and, and pray folks will use their imagination knowing that there's greater things to come. Even incredibly established composers these days are saying, oh yeah, I'm just doing a piece for, for keys, bass, drums, and guitar because we can't afford a full string section. And it's not, if I want my project to succeed, we need to be more you know, contained. So, and that's not just um, relevant to us as new musical theater composers, it's the establishment that's going in that direction. I mean, I'd love nothing more than for all of us to have huge 40 cast big book musicals <laughs> with like, you know, 50-person pits, but we do have to think about this reality until there comes a time and a way and the right group of investors to put something more grand together. I think we have to wrap it up now, Tari. Oh, sorry. Well, this has been Behind the Musical, um, the forum mod uh, formed by Kyle and Michael, and we've been talking with them, Zach and Joey, here at the Dramatist Guild. Um, thank you all. We're doing it again in February. We're yes, doing so. it again in February. February 11th. Keep an eye out. Thank yes. you. Keep an eye out.